Good afternoon. <laughs> May I request your attention in respectful silence during the presentation of the callers by the UNLV Air Force and Army ROTC Honor Guards, followed by the national anthem. Please stand. Please be seated. Thank you to our vocalist, Philip Harris, baritone first year student in the Doctor of Musical Arts program, and Katie Loon, pianist. I am Rhonda Montgomery, immediate past chair of the UNLV Faculty Senate. I am an associate professor in the William F. Hara College of Hotel Administration. We are here today for President Jessup's State of the University Address, and we are delighted to have many distinguished guests joining us in the audience. If you would please stand as you are introduced. We welcome representing Congressman Joe Heck, Kristen Maxwell. representing Congresswoman Dina Titus, Michael Naft. From the Nevada System of Higher Education, representing our Board of Regents, Chairman Richard Trachok. Vice Chairman Michael Wixom.
Cedric Creer. Mark DeBrava. James Dean Levitt. Trevor Hayes. And Sam Lieberman. Nevada System of Higher Education Vice Chancellors, Marsha Turner, and Constance Brooks. We welcome John Lee, Mayor of North Las Vegas. <laughs> President Emerita, Dr. Carol C. Harder. <laughs> Las Vegas Metro Chamber of Commerce President Kristen McMillan. Thank you all for joining us. I am here on behalf of Dr. Brian Spangelo, Chair of the Faculty Senate. Dr. Spangelo is currently attending to the most important task of a faculty at the university, and that is teaching. He is currently teaching his Biochemistry 1 474 class. Brian tried to beam himself here, but found out <laughs> that UNLV's technology is not yet up to warp speed. <laughs> so I am here to introduce the president. Today, UNLV has many new and exciting initiatives underway, including a new medical school. I see our planning dean, Barbara Atkinson, here. Hi, Barbara. And we have aspirations to achieve the distinction of a top-tier research university. How do we achieve all these ambitious objectives? In previous years and uh, in previous State of the University addresses, we have heard many plans about the future direction of this great university. Why would anyone believe that our current planning in, is in any way more substantive than before. What is different today? I can tell you that today we have a president who dis demonstrates a strong commitment to a shared governance model of university leadership. He is actively engaged faculty and staff in the planning process, and he is willing to listen to a variety of opinions about how we achieve our goals with a focus on academic excellence. I am extremely pleased to tell you that this president embraces an atmosphere of respect and civil engagement, and that such a positive environment will untether us uh, to commit our very best actions and opinions to the cause of higher education here at UNLV. We are all being encouraged to participate so that together we can make UNLV a better place to work, to study, and to engage with our community. So one final word from Dr. Spangolo, live long and prosper. <laughs> with that, it is my pleasure to introduce UNLV's 10th President, Dr. Lynn Jessup. Thank you, Rhonda. And I'm mic'd. Okay, good. Hey, you know, boy, I'm missing uh, a part of the script up here. I wonder if somebody could run something out from that side of the stage. Thank you, Metal Rebel, thank you. Congratulations on uh, how you did in the uh, defense, uh, defense Robotics Challenge put on by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. 
Uh, our little metal rebel here, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. At, uh, the Department of Defense invited 24 teams to this robotics challenge this past summer out in Southern California. Uh, and they were handpicked, some teams from industry, uh, some of the defense contractors were invited from universities like ours and MIT and Carnegie Mellon, uh, and from some other governments got invited to come and to participate. 24 teams and, and Metal Rebel, thank you, placed eighth. Eight out of the 24, well, way to go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks to Dr. Paulo and his team uh, for loaning us Metal Rebel. Call me. <laughs> well, thanks again, Rhonda, for the introduction. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and welcome everyone to the 2015 State of the University Address. And uh, in addition to all the, the, the folks that were uh, thank for being here and noted uh, earlier. I'd also like to thank those folks that are listening in on KUNV radio. We've also got folks watching our live stream on unlv.edu. We've got viewers on Vegas PBS Channel 10. And then I'd also like to thank UNLV TV and uh, their, the entire team for their efforts to film this event and make it available to folks later. So thank you all for that. This is uh, a very exciting time uh, to be at UNLV. Over the last, uh, so it's about eight months now uh, into the job, Christy and I, within the last month, finally moved into a home. We'd been living for about seven months out of an apartment, literally living out of boxes and suitcases, and it's nice to finally get settled in in Henderson. Uh, but for the last uh, three or four months, I've been saying, using this phrase, this university in this place at this time, it really is, uh, personally, a great opportunity to be here at UNLV doing what we're doing right now at a time when this Las Vegas Valley that we live in needs it, needs UNLV to be a top tier university more than ever. So I'm very excited to be here. If you think about what's happening in this region, this is just such a beautiful picture of the, of the Las Vegas skyline. Uh, a lot is happening in this valley right now. If you look at the, the long-term economic forecasts and the long-term population forecasts that go out several decades, Essentially, the top half of the United States is moving to the bottom half of the United States. That's where all the growth is, with the baby boomers and with a, a number of other things going on. And that growth is happening in very specific places along the southern United States. The southwest in particular, and southern Nevada in particular, is pointed out to be, by most of these forecasts, one of, if not the primary epicenter of growth and economic development in the coming decades. And you can feel that picking up again. It slowed down a little bit during the economic downturn, and now it's picked back up again. Uh, and you can feel that growth. Las Vegas is definitely trending up again, and so is the university. This is the perfect time for this university to be, a, to be working toward top tier status and all the effects that that has, both socially and economically, on the community within, within which this university is embedded. So the city is trending up, so is the university. This is a great photograph captured recently of our students. We welcomed our largest ever freshman class, about 4,000 students, and that's for the fourth consecutive year in a row. The growth here is, is quite unprecedented. Uh, we had a 15 to 20 percent increase in non-resident students. And Christy and I, just a few weeks ago, on a Friday night, maybe three Fridays ago, were with the recruiters. Uh, the recruiting team that was responsible for actively recruiting those students, both in-state, here in the community, throughout the state, and then out in the regions like California, where we actively recruit students, and we celebrated with them for a few minutes. Uh, they invited us to stay for the whole party, and I said, you know what, when I was in your shoes and the president showed up to something like this, I was just nervous and couldn't have fun, so we, we thanked them and congratulated the recruiting team and then said, now have fun without us, just relax. Uh, we took off. But, uh, quite, quite an amazing feat in, in recruitment. And think about this, freshman enrollment in particular at UNLV has grown uh, by about 40% since 2011. Think about that, and think about those cohorts now working their way through the system at UNLV, and I think it bodes well for the future of UNLV, and we will continue to grow. Let's look at some recent achievements, some of the fun stuff that's happened just in the last few months 
uh, here at UNLV, and then we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a top-tier university. So some achievements first. I want to brag a little bit about the Honors College. I've got my glasses on, Marta, but I think you're in that picture with the students. Uh, our Honors College is growing by leaps and bounds, uh, and bounds as well. The incoming cohort's about 270 students, so they've got now a total of 735 students. That incoming cohort is a, is a record breaker as well. Uh, the entering class has continued to grow, there's Marta, has continued to grow over the last several years. In fact, Marta tells us that it's quadrupled in the last four years. So great things happening in our Honors College, and as a result, incredible demand for our Honors College. Of course, you've, you've heard and read about our School of Medicine. Thank you to a lot of people in this room. Chief among them are the folks from our system office and our regents and helping us to get the full funding this last legislative session. Uh, and a number of community members also helping and literally flying up to Carson City and helping us to make sure that we got that full $27 million to launch the School of Medicine. And then the, the community rallying when our, our planning dean, Barbara Atkinson, said that, you know what, to make sure that we've got the best students we can get in that initial cohort of 60 students, we're targeting 60 students, first cohort, fall of 2017, and then they'll be in the medical school for four years before they move on to their residencies. Barbara said, we need to get scholarships for these students, because what happens is the students are taking a chance on us. We're not yet accredited when these students actually enroll and begin. So they're taking a little bit of a risk, but yet, the accreditation is based to a great extent on the quality of that incoming class of students, so you've got to have good students. And she said, we've got to get scholarships for these students. And I thought, well, okay, and we've got plenty of time. Uh, what are you talking about? And she said, no, we need like all four years. We need a scholarship for all four years for all 60 students, and we need it uh, by the end of the legislative session on June 1st. So we set about the goal of raising the $6 million or so that it was going to take to get all those scholarships pledged, and uh, led by Barbara and Bill Bolt and the others on the fundraising side of the house, and a number of people in the community that stepped up, and in particular, uh, Chris Engelstadt McGarry and the, and the Engelstadt Family Foundation, we not only got, in the time allotted by Barbara, uh, all of those 60 scholarships pledged, uh, but the Engelstadt uh, family and the Engelstadt Foundation did that kind of as an anchor gift, they did 25 of the 60 for that first cohort, four-year scholarships, 25 of them. Then they, after we were done, they said, let's, let's keep it going. We'll do 25 more for cohort two, 25 more for cohort three, and 25 more for cohort four, for a total of $10 million pledged for scholarships for the School of Medicine. Wow. <laughs> wow. That is a big check. Literally, that's a big check. Look at that. We needed <laughs> two regions to help us lift that check. <laughs> also, one of our programs, you know, at one point this was a new program also being launched in, in much the same fashion as the medical school, the Boyd School of Law. I d we just wanted to point out in a slide here that uh, also in U.S. News, uh, along with many other programs I'll note here in the next few minutes, uh, has reached its highest ranking ever at 67th ranked nationally by U.S. News. Uh, qu quite a feat for a, for a program that's really not that old. And for a discipline, the law discipline, uh, Dan Hamilton, I'm looking around, I saw him a moment ago. In fact, there's a great article just published within the last 24 hours, pointing out how difficult it is for law schools around the country. En enrollments are declining uh, for law schools around the country. Uh, a, a decision was made here, a very bold one, not to shrink the size of cohorts like a lot of other law schools have have done, uh, or to start letting people in that don't have good uh, test scores and, and sort of diluting the quality of the school. The, the uh, decision was made here to, in fact, to, to hold the line on quality with the incoming students. It would mean that we might have to get you know, a little bit smaller on some of the cohorts, but we wanted to continue to make sure that this was the best law school possible for the state of Nevada and for the country, and that proof is in the pudding. That is why uh, we jumped up so significantly in the U.S. News rankings. Thanks, Dan, and everybody helping with the law school. <laughs> Nursing school also probably seems like a relatively new program, but we will tonight be celebrating the 50th anniversary uh, for our School of Nursing. It's been here for 50 years and has had quite an impact uh, on the healthcare industry here in town and educating future leaders 
uh, within healthcare here around the valley. Also proud to say that within the last four or five months, US News and World Report ranked the master's program that our nursing college offers. They, they do an online master's program, and that was ranked sixth in the country by US News and World Report. That is, way to go, kudos to Carolyn and her team, but that is world class, that's, that's top, top tier for sure. On the research side, it's, uh, it's been, a, been a fun uh, last couple of months as we were kind of tallying up how the year went. Uh, we, we were up uh, for the third year row in a row in grant funded research expenditures and in, in sponsored research. And more to the point, if you think about the cycle of, of research, I'll go through research, creative, and scholarly activity, but first on the research side, we look at the cycle of discovery and then faculty disclose the things that they're discovering, the inventions. Then we try to lock down those inventions with patents. And then we license those discoveries, those technologies out to companies that then embed them in products and services within their companies. And so that's how the research finally fi finds its way into impact out, out in the world. Uh, and then we occasionally will have a spin out company. If something is interesting enough and appears to be a platform technology to build a, a company around, then you build a company around it. And a company spins out of the university. The, the front end of that pipeline has been cranking along really well the last few years. We've made a, a concerted effort in, with resources in tech transfer and commercialization with Tom Pahota's team and under the direction of Zach Miles on the economic development side. And so the, uh, in terms of that cycle and from innovation to impact, uh, the patents have gone up tremendously, mostly in science engineering and gaming innovation. But in the last two years, the patent part of that, that uh, cycle that I talked about, the patents have tripled. And I understand we had three or four good spin outs that came out this last year. And with the resources that we're spending and focusing on the econo economic development side of that pipeline, we expect more good things to come in spin out activity here from UNLV. That's great. That's research having a tremendous impact economically uh, here in the Valley. That's what top tier universities do. And we'll be doing more of that. We, need to, we recognize that we need to do more of it. What does that mean to be top tier? Uh, we've got a, a new graphic here that, we, that tries to capture a lot in one slide. So let's just take a look at that uh, for the moment, if you will. And I want to acknowledge, before I describe this, that this is not just efforts over the last few months. This goes all the way back, Carol, to your administration. Uh, and Neil carried on with themes of top tier and movements around the university that Don Snyder continued last year. But this has long been in the works at UNLV. Top tier means that you've got, to be, you've got to be good at everything that you do, not just research, but at everything that you do at the university. Good on the research, creative, and scholarly activity side of the house, but also good at teaching and learning and at the student experience and student achievement, the student outcomes, everything on the teaching side of the house as well. And, and that's not enough anymore either. You've got to be really good at working with, partnering with uh, groups and organizations out in your community because especially for a university like us, UNLV embedded in this valley and with everything that's happening uh, in, the, in the valley that we live in, in the three sister cities, the, we are inextricably linked. We have a shared destiny, the university and the community. We can't get to where we need to get to at the university without the help of the community. And likewise, the community can't get to the next level without a good, thriving research university that's, that's driving that community both economically and socially. That is the new model for modern research universities in metropolitan areas. We benchmark very closely with three really good research universities in metropolitan areas that have made the jump to top tier in the last 10 or 15 years, including physically visiting those universities to see how they're doing what they're doing. Arizona State University, University of Central Florida is a lot like us given the community that's it, that it's in with its focus on entertainment, and the University of Houston. So we've benchmarked them very, very carefully. We know exactly the model of achieving top tier and the benefit that that has on influencing the community within which the university is embedded. That's what, what drove us to the strategic planning process that took the entire school year. It's, it's how we identified, in fact, that we needed to think about top tier and about, about affecting every part of the campus. At the beginning of the prior school year, this began as a tier one process. Tier one, top tier, what's the difference? They sound a lot alike. Tier one's a really specific measure used by the Carnegie Foundation to classify and rank 
research universities based on things like grant-funded research expenditures and how many faculty do you have in the national academies. And it's a great measure of the, of the significance of the impact of that part of the university. And, and that, that is a part of our strategic plan. It is a part of top tier. But it's, it's a necessary but not the sufficient condition. We've got a lot more that we need to do here. That's not enough. That's what, you know, through this process of planning over the last year, what led us to realize we've got five pathway goals that have to be achieved to get to top tier. Got to be good at research, not just the research in the sciences and engineering, but, at, but everything that happens here in the creative and scholarly activity for all of the faculty. That, as I mentioned, uh, pathway goal number two, we got to get good at the things we do for students. This one isn't exclusive, uh, exclusive of the other. Research and teaching go hand in hand. We've got to be a great place for people to go to school. We've got to get this medical school launched and well embedded and integrated within the, the broader Health Sciences Center. We've got to get better, as I mentioned, at community partnerships, recognizing that we have a shared destiny. And then finally, we, re we recognize we've got some infrastructure to shore up, not only buildings, but also our business processes, our, our customer service has got to get better, uh, and that uh, shared governance is the way to, to do that, that the faculty and the staff and the administrators and the students and our regents, the system office and our volunteers, we've all got to work, at, work together to get everything done uh, in order to get to top tier. This is a 10-year proposition. That's why we're calling it the top tier 2025 plan. These other universities took 10 to 15 years to get to that level of impact in their communities. This summer, uh, we had, so the strategic planning process was done. We identified the five pathway goals and some of the sub goals and the resources that we needed within. And then this summer, we identified about 90 people, faculty, staff, administrators from around campus. And we said, we need to invite people that are actually gonna, gonna take assignments, people that actually will have, uh, Nancy's smiling because Nancy Rappaport, now our, our acting provost, spearheaded this process and said, I don't want anybody in the room that I can't give an assignment to. They've gotta actually be able to do something. So this was an internal group on campus to think about this next year, for, if this is a 10-year plan, what's got to happen this school year that we're in now in order to enable the rest of the things to happen for the rest of the nine years of the plan. And so we've got the nine groups now formed into, into five separate work groups, and they're working on implementation issues in each of the five goals. Uh, a lot going on in these five pathway goals right now at UNLV. So let's just take a quick tour. And we'll look at uh, just a quick sampling of some of the things going on in each of the goals. There are already some great things happening. A good example, I think, of what's, what's got to happen a lot more within each of these five areas. So we'll start in, in uh, research, creative, and scholarly activity. In research, I just wanted to highlight here quickly Ramona Denby Brinson from the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs. She has secured $12 million in research grants since coming to UNLV a short time ago. Her work is just perfect for this community. And think, you think about the impact that research has on a community. Her work is in social services, family and child welfare, foster children, and mental health. Talk about research innovation to impact on the community. She was also, because of that work, a 2015 recipient of the Harry Reid Silver State Research Award and was the first woman to receive that recognition. Way to go, that is high impact. Next, I just want to highlight uh, Brian Vilmore. This is classic discovery in the classic sense in research. Uh, UNLV anthropologist that's part of a broader, fantastic group in anthropology here, all of them, uh, toured their labs. Fascinating tour, I recommend it. Brian's part of an international research team that, that they're fossil hunters. Uh, they're doing most of their work in Africa. They found a little jawbone uh, that you can think about how big your jawbone is and how easy would it be to find one that's 2.8 million years old buried in the dirt in Ethiopia in what I understand a little community that's pretty tough to get into uh, not only physically but culturally. Uh, we can talk more about that later. But they were allowed in, the, the local people trusted them and let them in. They were the only research team that was allowed into this community in a remote area. And this little jawbone is proven to, to literally be the missing link, if you want to think of it that way. It's uncovering all kinds of interesting little gaps in the timeline of human evolution and was written up in science. Uh, back at University of Arizona, we used to, for fun, this is what faculty do when they're bored, we'd sit around at lunch and say, if you could pick three, four journals that you could publish in, any of them in any discipline, what would you choose? We were in the business school and science was the number one journal we picked. That'd be the one, that was the one that we would have wanted to publish in. So way to go, Brian, and the entire team in anthropology. <laughs> you 
Another great example, geosciences professor Matthew Lockney and his colleagues, of all places in caves uh, in New Mexico and, and Nevada, are collecting and analyzing cave deposits from these, these caves all throughout the, the region. And they're, they're constructing drought histories for the southwestern United States over the past 5,000 years. That's serious work funded by the National Science Foundation, and it provides a great context around the recent 12-year drought in the Colorado River Basin and other areas. Again, talk about research that's just, that just fits perfectly for the region that we live in. Uh, classic research, again, fun explor exploration, and, and not for those who are claustrophobic. I couldn't do it. I, yeah, way to go. We've also got a, a great bit of creative and scholarly activity that goes on all around campus that's, that's equally important and exciting. I'm highlighting here a group, this happens to be uh, t uh, students, and we talk a lot about the Latin Jazz Ensemble, ranked number one in the country by Downbeat Magazine. This time we thought we would highlight the Ragtime Rebels. This is a marimba, a marimba band that continues to represent UNLV at both national and international festivals. And this month they'll be per performing in Big Pine, California. And then in the spring of 2016, they represent UNLV in Australia. A great example of how great this university is in, in music and really throughout uh, the arts. Uh, and also a good example of some world-class activity going on here in, uh, in the creative activity on campus. I just came from uh, lunch. Uh, with Carol and with Bev Rogers and others. We're getting ready a little bit later today uh, to dedicate the, the building. I'll say a few words about that in a minute. But I just wanted to highlight the Black Mountain Institute. is again, a great example of creative activity going on on campus. This is one of the nation's foremost literary think tanks. They're thinking big. They're aiming high. Iowa, forget it. We're going we're gonna to unseat them. Uh, and we've got uh, a new face. Carol is, was instrumental in building up the Black Mountain Institute and getting it to where it is now. Huge uh, infusion of cash from Bev Rogers and the Rogers Foundation. Uh, and again, I'll highlight that when we're talking about some of the fundraising going on here in a minute. Uh, but huge impact. And now we've got a great new face uh, for the Black Mountain Institute in Joshua Shank. He's now the executive director. And, and we are positive, based on all the great things that you've done, uh, in your history that you will take the Black Mountain Institute to new heights. That is a program, I just love it. That's a program that's already topped here that's striving to be even better, to be the best. I love it. A, a look at some other scholarship activity happening around campus. So the distinction here is not necessarily grant-funded research that you would find in sciences or engineering, but creative and scholarly activity all around campus, kind of under the broader category of research that faculty do, equally important and interesting and exciting. In this case, I just wanted to highlight up in the upper corner of the left, Bill Messier in the Lee Business School was one of only two faculty members in the country. Think about that. Accounting is a huge discipline. It's one of the, one of the most popular majors all across the country. Huge major, lots of, lots of faculty across the country. Two faculty were chosen uh, to be given the 2015 Outstanding Accounting Educator Award through the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Foundation. PwC does this every year. One of two in the country, that is world class. And then also uh, the American Anthropological Association honored also from the anthrop anthropology group, uh, Professor uh, Deborah Martin with its annual award for excellence in undergraduate teaching. She'll be awarded that later in November. Uh, two faculty who are top in the nation and are a great example of the great faculty here at UNLV. Congratulations. <laughs> On the pathway goal of student achievement, there's a lot going on down inside that work group and, and what the, the goals and the milestones and the things that we've got to do. And we recognize that we've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of good work already going on. What, within that pathway goal to top tier status, we mean that this, is, this has got to become a school of choice, I mean, in a sense. That we already, many students do choose to come here. They're coming here in droves. We just had record enrollments, not only in terms of quantity, but we're seeing high numbers of valedictorians and merit scholars and the honors college growth that I talked about. But we need to do more of that. We need to become a school of choice, the top choice, the first choice among parents uh, and the students that choose to come here. 
There's a lot that has to happen in order for that goal to be realized. And there's a lot of work going on now improving the student experience through advising. We recognize we've got work to do there, but we're working on it. Uh, we recognize that we've got to do a better job with our retention rates, students that come and then they, they come for a year and then they, they come back the next year, and then our graduation rates, students that finally get through to graduation. Uh, the student experience, student achievement, we need to make sure that our degrees are becoming more and more valuable and that graduates are more employable and we need to be tracking better our placements or whatever the outcome is that the students want. They might want to move on to graduate school or some other outcome or go on to great performances within their field or whatever it happens to be. All of that builds towards school of choice. That's the goal with, uh, within that, that pathway goal, uh, the broader goal of student achievement. Lots of work left to, to be done there, but some good things happening here already that I'll mention. We wanted to highlight some uh, very particular work going on, <laughs> I'm looking at Dan, uh, from Mary Ann Winklemess in the provost office, uh, who happens to be the better half of Dan Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Dan. But she's doing a, a work on something that she calls the Transparency Project, driving greater transparency in teaching and learning. And in a nutshell, it's a project that helps students to be able to kind of look under the hood, if you will, for the classes that they're taking, to not only learn about the, more about the content that they're learning, if you will, but to understand more about the way that the course is being taught. And so it's a way for a, a, a conversation to happen between the teacher and the student about what assignments are being given and why are those assignments being given and what grading rubric is chosen for those assignments and why was that chosen? And how did, the, how did the teacher fill out the grading rubric? Why did a student get the grade that they did on those assignments? Why, you know, what's the philosophy behind the assessment? Uh, she's got more than 30 UNLV instructors currently participating. And she's been working on this now for a few years. Uh, she's reached 11,500 students across 27 institutions so far for this project. It's such a tremendous project that Mary Ann and, and UNLV by association are going to be featured in an article later this fall in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And in fact, just a couple days ago, Marianne and I were in an interview over the phone with the person writing, uh, Dan Barrett, I believe was his name, at the Chronicle, writing the article. So woohoo, I'm going to get in an article in Chronicle of Higher Education. It's <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Marianne. Thanks, Dan. Also on student achievement, again, there are good things happening here that, we, that are worth highlighting. We talk a lot about our Academic Success Center and the great work that Ann and her team are doing there. But think about this, when you think about retention rates, nearly 90% of the freshmen who use the Academic Success Center stay enrolled in the following semester of courses. Think about the impact that has on retention rates. And 96% of all the students who take advantage of the Academic Success Center, when they rate it on a Likert scale, they rate it as that, that the service that they found to be very helpful at the highest category. There are tremendous things happening in our Academic Success Center. We, just, we need to grow it. We need more students being able to take advantage of those kinds of services around campus, not only for advising, but coaching and mentoring and all the other great things that happen in that center. We also uh, have a great new project going, the Student Success Collaborative, and next week we'll be presenting uh, more on this initiative that's tied to our efforts at retention, progression, and completion here at UNLV. This is sort of, uh, it's uh, for the Oakland A's fans in the room, this is sort of billy ball applied to retention, progression, and completion. It's the application of analytics uh, to the progression of students. This is a data-driven effort on campus that its aim is to identify students that are in need of academic counseling and to improve their outcomes by using predictive analytics to monitor student progress and ultimately figure out how exactly to intervene with that student and when and by whom to improve their retention and graduation rates. It's a best practice sweeping the country uh, and it's a part of the initiative here uh, to, to do better at student achievement. Preliminary projections reflect that our six-year graduation rate is increasing by several percentage points or will shortly based on work coming out of the predictive analytics, what we're seeing happening with the retention rates now based on freshmen, and our extrapolation of that to our graduation rates, we think good things are gonna come out of the work going on here. And a lot of people uh, in this auditorium now, I'm looking at several faces responsible for that, and thank you, that is difficult, dedicated work, but so highly important and impactful here. More work to be done there, but, but a lot of good things already happening at UNLV. Thank you. Thanks. 
also wanted to highlight just a, a, a few others on the student achievement side. The students now, this time in the Lee Business School, uh, the business school jumped 28 spots in the most recent uh, U.S. News World Report ranking that just came out within the week. And then within the, about four or five months ago, uh, kind of uh, back within the spring semester, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the AICPA, has a national case competition, and they invite all the accounting programs and all the business schools in the country to, to, to join and compete. Last year, they had 140 teams, so 140 different business schools were represented. represented. Our accounting students from the Lee Business School went and won the entire competition first place. That's, that is top tier. That's also a big check, literally. How many students does it take to hold up? Sorry. And then to uh, identify one student in particular that we're very proud of, Daniel Wakwa is a senior history major and a member of the UNLV Honors College. He is, and we're so proud that he learned recently that he received the Truman Scholar, uh, he's a 2015 Truman Scholar. Think about that, there are hundreds and hundreds of universities from which students applied to be a Truman Scholar. They choose 50, this last round they chose 58 recip recipients nationwide, and one of our students, Daniel Wakwa, received one. That's incredible. <laughs> Daniel, way to go. And then finally, uh, within this, this uh, pathway goal to top tier status, uh, just a moment to, to just take, to, just to take a second and think about the rich and vibrant and beautiful diversity of this university and of this community. I think you all know that we've long been a minority serving institution. We've been ranked uh, for five consecutive years in the top 10 by US News for the diversity of our, our student body. We've been ranked sixth last year and in the last few days we learned that US News moved us from sixth to second, the second most diverse campus in the country, which is, in, which is incredible. We learned back in the spring also that we met the threshold for the Department of Education on Hispanic serving institution status. So we now, that's 25% Hispanic uh, uh, composition in the student body. So we now hold and need to now hold on to the HSI designation as well. We're doing a lot, spending a lot of time and effort and resources on making sure that the, the diversity and the inclusiveness of this campus continues. We brought in a nationally renowned consultant, Damon Williams, to have a look at us and make recommendations. We made changes based on the recommendations. Uh, Reiner Spencer moved over to run our Office of Diversity and Inclusion and is now also our Chief Diversity Officer. Thanks, Reiner. Uh, we implemented a, a, a campus climate survey to learn more about how people are thinking about and feeling about our diversity and inclusion. We are implementing changes based on the climate survey. And then we've also recently, over the summer, hired Barrett Morris. I'm not sure if Barrett is with us. Uh, but Barrett is our new compliance officer. First time for us to have a compliance officer and we're building a team around him to ensure that we continue to be a place that's about diversity and in inclusiveness uh, here on this campus. And then on the third pathway goal, the School of Medicine and the Academic Health Center, uh, a, a lot going on, just a few quick highlights. It's been so fun to watch Barbara and her, her team now launching with the help of, of the system office, Marsha and our regents. Uh, we've got a health sciences committee led by James Dean Levitt. We've got a lot of, lot of folks in the regents and around the community doing a lot of heavy lifting quickly uh, now that this, uh, the uh, medical school has been funded. Uh, so there's a lot going on with accreditation. We've got hiring now that's got to happen in droves. Uh, we've got facilities that, we've got some short-term facilities needs because we've got faculty coming on board and students that'll be here before we know it. Uh, and fundraising like crazy now is in high gear. Uh, a curriculum is being built. Uh, we're hearing back from the LCME, the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, the, the, which is the accrediting group, hearing back from them that the, that, the, that the first instantiation of the curriculum is looking very innovative. I can tell you, coming out of a professional school where I thought we did hands-on education, experiential learning really well, uh, we got nothing on what's going on in the, in the medical school. This is a very problem-based, experiential, hands-on, community-focused curriculum. An example, uh, one of the first things the students are going to do when they get here in the fall of 2017 is they're going to go out and become credentialed as EMTs. They're going to be in this community actually being credentialed and serving as emergency medical techs. 
And then the curriculum is filled with really neat hands-on experiences like that all through the four years. Very hands-on and community focused. Really exciting to see what's happening in the medical school. It's important to us that it be well integrated. And so Barbara's doing a good job of talking with the other deans and the other folks in our other health sciences related units in nursing, dental medicine, community health sciences, and allied health sciences to make sure that we take an integrated approach as we build out the entire academic health center. There are also some tremendous uh, examples of partnering going on, not only within the health sciences, but, but beyond the health sciences programs on the campus. For example, uh, medical schools working with the clinical program we call the Autism Center. That's within the College of Education. The focus there is on, on mental health care, and there's a great partnership now starting between the medical school and the Autism Center within the College of Education, as well as an interesting new partnership between the School of Medicine and the Hera Hotel College focused on hospitality in healthcare. So think about that for a moment. When you go to your doctor, you go to a clinic, you go to the hospital, what's your experience like? What's the level of quality of the experience and of the customer service that you receive? Some at the forefront in the provision of healthcare aspire for healthcare provision to be at the level of service at the high end that you'd find in hospitality. We've got some of the best hospitality venues in the country just a few blocks over, and that new partnership is, is aimed at bringing that kind of level of quality uh, to healthcare. I think it's a great new partnership between a, a great program on campus in the Hotel College and our School of Medicine. There are a number of other neat things going on in, in terms of community partnerships at UNLV. We recognize we've got a lot of work to do. I've gotten a lot of feedback over the last eight or nine months that this university can sometimes be a difficult organization to work with uh, from folks out in the community. I get it. I, I, I got it. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, we've got the seeds of good things already happening, some great partnerships already. A recent one that just also happens to be health science related, UNLV and the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health have just, in a partnership with UNR and a bunch of other schools and some great faculty all around, uh, recently garnered an $11 million grant from the National Institutes of Health, and that'll help to tackle Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. And on that one, credit's got to go to Jeff Cummings uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Jeff Cummings is a rock star. Uh, he's fantastic, not only in brain health here locally, but nationally, and has been the driver of this great partnership between UNLV and the Cleveland Clinic. On our side, we've got Jefferson Kinney, uh, Joe Lombardo from the University's Supercomputing Center, uh, just from the, as a psychology professor, and also Marty Schiller and his group from the Nevada Institute of Personalized Medicine, all as part of that partnership. Another great example, this one also the College of Education, I'm really proud of our Troops to Teachers program. This is a partnership between our UNLV College of Education, the Clark County School District, and the Department of Defense. And the whole idea here is to put together, they've got a specialized baccalaureate program available for individuals who are transferring out of the military who are interested in pursuing a career in education. They want to be a teacher or do something else in the school district. A great three-way partnership going on with our College of Education. Uh, just tremendous on so many levels. Uh, and, and in December, the College of Education will be hosting an education summit statewide education summit with Governor Brian Sandoval and a number of other uh, noted luminaries in education. Really proud of what's going on in our College of Education and reaching out and helping to drive the community. Earlier this month, uh, the Boyd School of Law had so many interesting partnerships that we could point to for Boyd Law. But in this case, the Boyd School of Law and the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada have begun offering these new free community, free, nothing that lawyers do is free. So I don't know, how are you guys doing this? Uh, but this is free, and a lot of what they do for the community is in fact free. Uh, community legal education, uh, some courses designed to help people evaluate whether or not they've got an, a, a legal immigration, a, a path to legal immigration status in the U.S. and then to help them to pursue that. And this is in, in addition to the long-standing practice of providing free legal advice on a host of issues here in the community, including family law, divorce, custody, paternity, bankruptcy, and a number of other topics. And now something fun, uh, and just a couple more on community partnerships. You might remember Desert Soul. That's the little house that's out at the Springs Preserve. A couple of years ago, a team of UNLV students actually built a little, little sustainable house. Uh, and, then it, and then it's now housed out at Desert Springs. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend you go look at it. We just had a team of UNLV students in a similar uh, competition, work in partnership. There were students from archi the architecture program, 
from our College of Engineering and folks from the Moapa tribe here in the region all work together to design the, the design that you're looking at there, an energy sustainable home that has a net energy usage of zero, so a completely sustainable home. And that one won an award of excellence from the Department of Energy. And I'm gonna share a little video uh, about the students and about their experience. The goal, design an affordable zero energy home that meets the cultural and housing needs of the Moapa Southern Paiutes. The result, an excellence in design award from the US Department of Energy. That's what UNLV engineering and architecture students won at this year's Race to Zero, where students compete to design net zero homes. Net zero means that a home over the course of a year essentially uses the same amount of energy that it produces. With faculty guidance from architecture professor Alfredo Fernandez Gonzalez and engineering professor Dave James, the UNLV team designed a two-bedroom, two-bath home that exceeded the energy performance requirements set by the DOE. So we use a series of uh, strategies um, that are low energy use, for example, shading, passive solar heating, and uh, natural ventilation, which help minimize the energy consumption of the building and in doing so, we were able to not only exceed performance standards, but create a home that is both beautiful, inspiring, and of course, something that is very easy to maintain. UNLV hopes to partner with the Tribal Council to fund and ultimately build the Desert Sunrise Home as a visitor center. UNLV recognizes that it's here to serve its community, and the Moapa Paiute are certainly our neighbors and our friends, and we're happy to work with them. Congratulations to those students, wonderful achievement. Let me tell you, two months ago, Christy and I were ready to pay for that home to be built. We would have moved into it. Uh, we were getting desperate. <laughs> and finally, just a few other quick examples of some great partnerships that are just, they're, they're the exemplar of what we need to be doing more of. UNLV engineering researchers uh, we're partnering with uh, other university research and state agencies, all on a project that they're calling the Solar Water Nexus. That one uh, is, I'm looking at Rama, is a $20 million research project, a huge collaborative that enhances solar energy technology and advances the understanding of the connection between solar energy and water usage and the surrounding environment here in Nevada. Again, another great example of a huge partnership, lots of partners, great, great opportunity for funded research, and in a topic area that's just perfect for this region and what's going on with the drought. This one I'll end with on community partnerships and that pathway goal. Uh, this is a, I'm just, I'm so proud of folks at UNLV and here in the community for even, for even attempting to do this. This is a bold partnership with us and the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. We put in a bid together back in the spring to host a 2016 presidential debate here on the UNLV campus. Uh, th th this is a daunting activity. This takes a lot to do, to do this. This is not the primary debates that are going now. This is the actual presidential debates that will happen a year from now. We put in a, a bid to put on a debate here on campus because these debates bring a unique energy and a national, if not international, spotlight onto the campuses that host them and onto the communities that host them. And we want that for UNLV and for this valley. Conservatively, it's estimated that more than $50 million in national and international publicity accrues to the universities that host the, these events. Uh, faculty and staff and students also get to experience the political process firsthand. And most people think that this is going to be a big season for debates. You can see it begin, beginning to heat up now. Uh, it, when we get to a year from now, there won't be an incumbent. That brings out more voters and more interest. We're a swing state anyway. Uh, that makes this state interesting. There's a lot of reasons why we think that if we can get a debate, it will be even bigger than they usually are. It will be huge for this campus. Uh, this is, to me, just an example of swinging for the fences uh, to try to get something big. Uh, I'm just proud that we've applied. We should know within the next several weeks whether we've got it. But I'm just, I'm happy that we're trying to do things like this. And then uh, we'll move on to the final pathway goal, just about done. Uh, infrastructure, our business processes, our, our customer service, and shared governance as a, as a vehicle for, for doing everything within this strategic plan. 
We know that we've got to do a better job at improving and refining our internal business processes and our customer service on campus. We've got to be a, a, better, a better organization for other organizations to work with. And we know that we've got to be an easier place for our employees to, to get their business done on this campus. The Forbes ranks the best organizations in the country to work with or to work at, pardon the grammar. Uh, and universities make that list. Uh, the university I just came from, University of Arizona, made the Forbes list of best places to work last year. So that is one of many goals that we've, we've set out for within this pathway goal. We think there's a lot of really neat things happening already, but we recognize it's an area that we've got to get, got to get better at. The, uh, some quick examples uh, I'll give. Uh, our, we took our tech transfer team and our research foundation and our research park, and that's now all been integrated into one single point of contact to make it easier for people who do things with the university from an economic development point of view. I'll tell you the stuff that happened uh, for the last 12 months that SWITCH was responsible for, the integrated research network dedicated for the campus, and then really SWITCH uh, having Intel come in to provide access to a supercomputer, the Cherry Creek supercomputer, uh, out of the SuperNAP. That is already paying dividends on this campus and making, making it easier for faculty to do research that involves intensive uh, computing. So there's some, some great examples that are beginning to make this an easier place to work. But I'll tell you, the most inspiring thing I've seen is that Kate Corgan, where's Kate? Kate and her team in the Graduate College decided a few months ago that they were just going to take it on themselves and set a goal for their team uh, for, for excellent customer service. They're calling it 100% solutions, that they wanted to provide 100% solutions. They want to be problem solvers for everybody that interacts with and, and has issues or has got questions or anything uh, with the graduate college. And that was so inspiring that Nancy and I decided that for the president's office and the provost's office, we're going to do it too. Uh, we're trying to think of our own tagline. We can't think of anything as cool as 100% solutions, but we're right with you. Can we borrow it? Maybe we'll just use yours. <laughs> uh, but we're committed to that level of service too. We like, we like the ring of that, 100% solutions. We're about solutions for people. And that attitude that already permeates this campus in a number of places and it's quickly taking hold, that's how we've got to act. We've got to be a, a better and more efficient and effective organization. I also want to mention along this, uh, on this pathway goal that we are making a concerted effort, as Rhonda said, to work closely with the faculty and with the faculty senate, and in particular with the officers of the faculty senate. And I feel like we've made some good headway in doing that. We'd like there to be more inclusive, participatory, and therefore ultimately more effective uh, decision-making processes on campus. Uh, Brian Spangalo, who couldn't be here uh, uh, I, I can't get the signal that down as well as you did, uh, but Brian uh, and Nancy, our acting provost, and I, have, have, we, we've joked that we don't want there to be much daylight between the three of us uh, on decision making, and when any, whenever anything hits, we want each other to know about it and for us all to be working together, and I feel like we've done a good job of doing that. And I can't, one of the people in the faculty senate said it, and I can't remember who, but it's, it's, it's not just shared governance, it's shared destiny. Our destiny is shared at this university, and we've got to work together, all of us, uh, to get there. You said that. I did? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I probably heard somebody else say it. So. In the infrastructure and shared governance, a big part of that also is infrastructure, it's facilities. Uh, Jerry Bamati tracks a list, there's Jerry and his team, of about two dozen, maybe close to 30 different projects going on on campus right now, for, and maybe more than that. Uh, the most recent list that I reviewed with you was about 25 or 30. But projects, from facilities from small to big, all the way from ripping out turf, which we've done en masse on this campus to, to be a more uh, a, a drought uh, conscious campus, all the way to really big buildings. And I'll just, I'll note a couple of the bigger projects that are going on at the top of that list. I mentioned earlier that we'll be dedicating here in just a little bit, a little later today, uh, the Beverly Rogers Literature and Law Building. And that's a great synergy between the Black Mountain Institute, the Honors College, the English Department all in one building, also complemented by the Boyd School of Law, which has a, a presence in that, that building as well. We'll be doing that at four o'clock today and dedicating that new building. The Rogers Foundation is invested over the last two years, 30 million into the Black Mountain Institute, and this year, 20 of that 30 million 
that's a, it's a huge infusion of capital that's having, making a huge difference on the Black Mountain Institute and made it easier for us to put that, that building together. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. You probably can't miss what's going on with the Thomas and Mac. That's a massive renovation that's happening. The Thomas and Mac is, this is, a, this is a very popular venue for a variety of events, not just UNLV athletics events. In fact, that's a small fraction of the overall events that happen in that venue. That venue within the last year has been ranked the number one venue for big events, uh, for, for venues of its kind on university campuses. And among all venues, whether they're on university campuses or not, it ranks within the top, top 11 in the country. It is a busy building. And so we're spending a lot of money to stay competitive and renovating. The, the renovations will be complete in 2016. Some of it you'll see, some of it you won't see. Uh, there are system upgrades going on that won't be as visible, but there will be concourse and, and concessions, improvements and expansions restroom expansions and remodeling, seat replacements, uh, new ways to get around that building with, with portals, and the expansion and remodeling of some event space. There, in fact, is some new event and meeting rooms being added that may, will make it an even better venue for people on campus to have meetings and other people. That'll be done here in spring of 2016. And then in the summer of 2016, the second phase is completed. That actually is a 35,000 square foot expansion on the west side of that building that'll add a huge, beautiful event space to the west that'll look out toward the strip. That is gonna be a perfect, large gathering place, not only for us, but anybody who wants to use that building. That'll be done in summer of 2016. Another big project going on uh, that with, with a lot of potential for us. As I've mentioned, this campus is growing like crazy. We have run out of room on the main campus. We're squeezing things in between other buildings as best we can. There's an opportunity uh, on a pretty significant, in fact, the only large contiguous piece of ground that's anywhere near the edges of campus, and it's shown here on this map. We're in the, it's 42 acres just to the west of, so if you look toward the left side of that image, the west side of campus, that would be butting right up against the MGM properties. That's Tropicana, and then that's Kova going right through there. That 42 acres is vacant. We've got an option on it. We're in due diligence on it. Uh, we're reporting out on how that's going with the Regents. We'll present it for the final discussion and decision in December at the December Regents meetings. We're trying to figure out a, a reasonable business model for securing that property. We, we need to find a, a way to do it. We need the land. And it's not just the 42 acres. The county also controls 38 acres in between that spot and the parking lots of the Thomas and Mack Center that you can see to the east on the right side of that graph. So this is really about acquiring 80 acres of continuous land from the university heading out toward the Strip. Uh, we need it, we've outgrown this campus. Uh, this is a, really one of the few big pieces of ground. There's a lot that we can do with it, maybe a stadium, maybe not, but we need it regardless of whether a stadium goes on that land. And I hope we find a way to, to do it. And then finally, uh, some, big, some other big projects going on that I'll mention quickly. The new academic building for the Hara Hotel College, that's well underway. We got the approval for the 24 million or so of funding from the state. Remember, that was a 50-50 project. We've got to raise the other half of that. We've got, so 24 million is the, the immediate goal for fundraising. We've got 18.3 million of that pledged. That project's well on its way. That went a little quick. Let's see if I can get the one in the middle. I might not be able to. In the middle is a picture of the clubhouse for the baseball program. Tony and Lindy Marnell ha have donated $2.5 million, there it is, for us to, that's under construction right now, a baseball facility that becomes the home for that program. It's not only much needed space for those student athletes, but it pulls them and their coaches and staff out of the lead building and also then frees up space back in that building for, for other folks in athletics. And then, uh, I thought that I'd also end on this section with this picture of the, of the football team. Uh, we, we have got to, our athletics programs need to do well. There's a variety of reasons why that needs to happen. It's important to the academic mission of the university that our athletics programs do well. It not only provides a great learning and leadership opportunity for the student athletes, and there are about 450 of them, and they're very important to us as well, but it's also uh, a very enriching experience for the rest of us on campus, both the faculty and the staff and the administrators and the students, for all of us. 
And then finally, we, we, we talk about it being a window to the university. For people off campus, it's the window through which they look uh, to see what's going on at the university. And in fact, it's the way that many people in the community not only interact with the university, but it's how they shape their perceptions of us and how they form their, their perceptions of the brand of the university. So it's important for us that athletics does well and continues to operate in the right way. And they, and they are doing that. We're very proud of what's happening in athletics. I, I wanted a football picture because I just want to take 30 seconds. Just let me say how proud I am of Tony Sanchez. I'm so proud of a high school coach coming in, tough gig, Division I team, hasn't been done very often, only four or five times in the history of the NCAA, and it hasn't gone well in the other instances. Tony has come in and really has been an injection of energy and discipline and spirit and so many great things into our football program. And he had to start off, unfortunately, with three powerhouse football teams. Uh, Northern Illinois, if you don't follow football, you don't know that they are a national powerhouse. One of the five most winning teams in the country over the last five years. Had a, a, a huge season last year, highly ranked this year. That's the first game, the first draw. Tony Go travels to Northern Illinois. The spread was something in the neighborhood of 20, 21 points. I mean, they were really predicted to just clobber us. And at their stadium, Tony and the, and the team took that team to within a touchdown, almost won, had a chance to win that game at the end of the season. Then they faced UCLA last week, and that was a home game. But UCLA is an even better team, a, a quantumly better than NIU. This is a 13th ranked Pac-12 team expected to compete for the bowl championship. They are a, that's a good team, also large point spread. Uh, we didn't quite cover the spread on that game, <laughs> but uh, I talked with Tony right after the game that night and let him know how proud I was. Our team fought. I watched every second of that game, and our team fought right till the end of that game. I was very proud of them. Uh, we got another tough matchup in Michigan. Uh, <laughs> Tony knew we had this schedule before he signed up. Uh, it's going to be a tough, tough game in Ann Arbor, but look out, Mountain West. Look out, Mountain West, when we get there. <laughs> and, and finally, i just end with this. Uh, what a great picture. Things are looking up. We are looking up at UNLV. We've got a bold new direction to be a top-tier university with many bold new initiatives within it. Uh, we've got big aspirations here, quite frankly. Uh, the achieving top-tier status is so important to this university and to this community. Uh, you know, we can't do it alone. We need your help, everyone in this room and in this community to get there. So far, we've gotten a heck of a lot of help. Uh, thank you to the regents and the system office and a number of people who lobbied in the legislative session for us. It was a fantastic legislative session for the whole Nevada system and in particular for UNLV with about 60 million or so in additional funding to this campus and one time in recurring money. Uh, huge shot in the arm for this campus. We needed that capital infusion. Also, uh, and now I'm announcing officially, I've been, uh, been giving hints of this the last several weeks, uh, but also the community stepped up from a fundraising point of view and I am officially announcing today that this past year from a fundraising point of view was the best fundraising year for UNLV in five years and was the second best year ever for UNLV in private giving. And I'm looking at Bill and Nancy. We're now counting this prior year at 74.9 million in new funding. Congratulations to you all because it's a fundraising is a team sport. We all did that together. 75 million in, in new, new gifts and new pledges. Uh, and then we're doing things on our own to also supply the fuel that we need to grow. In addition to continuing to work with the state, they're going to do what they can. We're going to work with the donor community to do what they can. We've also asked the deans to talk to faculty in their college and look for ways that the colleges can grow, where they've got high demand programs that they can grow with quality. We've said if you've got programs like that, under the right conditions, we can, we can let those programs capture, retain 70%, 70 percent, seven zero of any net new tuition revenue that they generate. That, that needs to stay with those students in that program and be spent on those students in that program. That's an entrepreneurial new way to look at how we do business uh, in, in universities around the country. We've got a great set of proposals that we're now going through and we'll expect more growth there. And then finally, in closing, uh, this really is an exciting time to be at UNLV, at this university, in this place. 
at this time. We recognize that we've got a lot of work to do, uh, and a lot of things that need to be better, but, but you know, a lot of good things that are happening as well, and it's a bright future for UNLV. Imagine the future here. Imagine how 10 or 12 years, like happened at the other metropolitan research universities that I, that I described earlier, our benchmark schools. Imagine this university a decade from now, where in addition to all the great creative and scholarly activity that's going on, that the research in the, in the science and engineering disciplines is at a level where there's a steady supply of spin-out companies coming out of this university and embedding in this community. So we're enriching the community, and we're also adding directly to the economic development and to the diversity of the Southern Nevada economy. Imagine a place that's a school of choice, where the advising is great, the student experience is great, from, from t uh, t tip to, from, from bow to stern, uh, and that we become a school of choice, top choice for students. We'll have this medical school launched and running and well integrated with the other areas of health sciences, not only supplying the thousands of doctors that this community needs, but also we estimate with economic development impact on, of its own of $1.2 billion here in Southern Nevada. Uh, imagine a university built on great community partnerships that this is, that's what we do, it's part and parcel and we're a great organization to work with, and, that it's a, and a great organization to be an employee at as well. Great place to work at with great facilities and great business processes uh, of our own. Imagine that university in 10 years, an, an even big, bigger and better UNLV. I'm so excited to be here. I'm lucky and proud <clears throat> to be associated with this university. It's an honor to be the president of UNLV. Thank you for all of you for your hard work and dedication. And I'm confident that working together, we can and, and will achieve great things. Thank you, and go Rebels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, as we conclude the program, thank you for that, please sit down. Uh, as an example of great creative activity going on here at UNLV, we're gonna end with a performance by the UNLV Department of Music Trumpet Ensemble, directed by Barbara Hall. So let's give a very warm uh, round of applause for Barbara and her team. Barbara.